welcome to this edition of Peak, Peak Performers, Performers Podcast. Podcast with your host, Thor Conklin. Thor will be sharing the necessary tools, strategies, and psychology you'll need to become a peak performer in any area of your life or business. Welcome back to another episode of the Peak Performers Podcast. We have a great guest. A matter of fact, we were delayed probably about 10 minutes because we were sitting here talking. I was like, wait a second, this is some good stuff. Let's get the bio out first. Let everybody know who you are, and then we'll dive into some of the good stuff. So we already started without the audience. So welcome back if uh, you missed the beginning, which everybody did, because it's not going to end up in the recording. But uh, we have uh, Leonard Chung with us today. He is a driven, I'm sorry, he is driven by passion and innovation and people. He is the founder and CEO of Hello Chava, a company reimagining productivity tools for the solo professional. Now, I know there's a bunch of solo professionals out there listening today to today's podcast. So listen up. This is some really cool stuff here. As a serial entrepreneur, Leonard has been recognized for identifying emerging markets and launching successful products with a particular focus in SaaS collaboration, which we were just talking about of how cool and in vogue SaaS products are right now and will be for some time. Cloud computing and big data. Leonard developed the first gen products as founder and CEO of Syncplicity. Did I get that right? You got that perfect as well as SETI Home, Scale 8, IBM, and Microsoft. It was really interesting, Leonard. Uh, someone in your organization reached out, which we get all kinds of unsolicited um, requests to come on the show. And generally, you know, you kind of go through those. There's a lot of, of startups in there. And then I saw you come up. I was like, whoa, this is very cool. You have an amazing company. And before we dive into everything about the company, I, I want to uh, – bring something up that you and I were talking about right before we started. And uh, we were talking about, you know, journaling and taking notes and, and how everything now is you're just taking everything electronically. And we were talking about when you go to search for something, you know, you're looking for one thing. And very often you find older notes that, that are somewhat related to the search that you were doing. Tell me what you were saying before we got on air here. Yeah. And by the way, thanks for having me on Thor. But, uh, uh, you know, what we were talking about was, um, I've been taking digital notes for a very long time, forever, basically. And uh, oftentimes when I do a search for a given item, uh, along with trying to find the thing I was looking for, often search results come up for older notes. And if I have the time, I always take a moment to actually just read and skim through a previous note because uh, I think it's important not just to try to get to the information as to where you are right now, but also remember back, what have I learned, right? And there's a, if, for me, it's important because it builds in little moments of reflection to say, okay, where was I right? Yeah. And then also, where the heck was I wrong? And that's, that's often, right? Um, but it, it's one of those parts that if, I think we're so hurried in today's world that if you don't build in little habits, uh, little moments in time where you get to reflect on where you've been, not just where you are right now, we don't really get to improve as people um, quite as quickly. Yeah, absolutely. I think the universe also sends us signs uh, in different manners that you know are really applicable, and so often we overlook them. You know, today, liter literally, you can't make this stuff up. Uh, at the end of when I'm on somebody else's show, at the end, I always offer the audience: if you have anything going on in your life or your business send me a 50 word or less email and I'll send you back a four step process to absolutely eliminate that problem or greatly reduce it. And a lot of people write in with some amazing stories of, of what's going on in their business. And I literally followed up with a woman that wrote in in December. She had a horrific story and the details don't matter. And I sent her a follow up. I said, I just, I was touched by your story and I said, how are things going? Hopefully the information I sent you was helpful. And she wrote back today. She goes, I was just talking about you last night of how cool it was for someone like you to take time out of your day to write a personal email. They didn't get dropped into a, a drip campaign or anything. And it was touching. And, and the story is, it, I'll start crying if I tell a story. But it's when, what, what you're looking for and what caught my attention when you were telling that story is so often we're looking for one thing and we find something else. But what we really need to find is something else, not exactly what we were looking for. And we you know. It's uh, so I, I was mentioning just a little earlier, I just got engaged uh, last weekend. And so, you know, perhaps I've been in a uh, thank you, um, you know, very reflective, you know, mood. But uh, it, it is something I think 
you know, when we look at um, uh, whether it's work or personal, um, one thing that always strikes me is often what you're looking for isn't the thing that you're looking for. And what I mean by that is uh, whether it's an idea that um, develops over time and you kind of realize actually this is the right way and not the way I premised earlier, or like in my case, right, my, uh, my fiance said, boy, you had a lot of deal breakers that I excluded people previously due to. I won't tell you what they are, but it was a, a litany when she, uh, when she mentioned them. Um, but, you know, she said, but I saw other things that I didn't expect to see. And that made up for it. And it kind of really spoke to the fact that I think uh, as people, sometimes we over-index. And I think in particularly today's modern world, we over-index on you got to know exactly what you want. It's true, but to the, you know, I would say directionally versus trying to be, you know, an oracle and know down to the minute, you know, dotting the I's and crossing the T's exactly what that is. You got to have some flexibility to grow. Yeah. And, you know, and every entrepreneur that I have on this show, I don't want to say 100%, but probably 90% all started out in a business that they're no longer in today. They started out, you know, going down one lane. We did, you know, mm -hmm. at performance, we we're a profitability consulting firm. And we thought our primary or our ideal customer would be those that are suffering uh, from lack of profitability. What we found out was the people that are attracted to us are ones that are profitable and just want to get better. I, I didn't. You know, and I'm a pretty smart guy. I figured, you know, I knew the market. I thought that's what it would be. And it was completely different. And if we stayed focused on, you know, this is our lane, this is what we do, this is our ideal client, we completely would miss the market. Yeah, absolutely. It, I've learned that lesson and seen that happen time and time again. Yeah. Yeah. And so many entrepreneurs get stuck in that mindset of this is what we do. We don't do this and they miss the boat. So now that we haven't spoken about anything related to business, uh, <laughs> let's dive in a little bit about uh, your company. How did it get started? Why did it get started? First, that's a really cool company. I, I want to tell the audience what it is. Yeah. So it, it's super simple. Uh, we basically say, look, why can't your work phone number work for you? And what we mean by that is uh, it's a phone number, so you can add that to your personal phone, and it allows you, therefore, to separate your work and your personal life because the number you're giving out now is no longer your personal cell phone, but uh, this Hello Chava number. And then importantly, we don't just say, okay, now you're left to your own devices there. We actually superpower uh, what's actually happening there. And so we do these, we have what's called a co-pilot that does smart automations and workflows based off the data that's happening uh, and is being built within the messages and the chat conversation itself. So what is the habit that that replaces? You know, I do this all the time. I'm sure, um, you know, you've had this happen too. When you go back and you go, wait, what was the follow-up I was supposed to do with this given client? And you start scrolling back. And that's always a sign of trouble, right? Because it's like, oh, shoot, what the heck was I doing? And then you try to go, okay, and then let me go and let's say schedule a time with someone. Now I'm going to remember what I did last. I'm going to try to remember their preferences. I'm now going to go con you know, check out my calendar, check out my client notes. These are a lot of steps to do a very basic operation. And uh, kind of our aha moment was, wait a minute, uh, you can use technology nowadays, AI and you know, basically good UI and say, okay, let's augment the human. Let's make it so that, you know, when you're at that drafting a message thing and you're trying to remember what the heck you're supposed to do, you can just hit a single button to say, okay, let's suggest times and it's already taken account into account uh, the patterns and habits of your, your client. It's taken into account your current calendar, your preferences. Uh, and you can imagine that extending across other workflows. But, you know, we're really taking a, a stance to say, look, the solo professional, which is our audience, and we call them, we call them agents. These are folks who own uh, a book of clients um, that they actually have to manage themselves. They're almost like a little, you know, their own PL, whether they work for themselves or they're like an insurance agent that's part of a larger company. They're having to manage all these relationships, and more and more of them are all moving into messaging. And, you know, when you start, the plus of messaging is people read text messages much more often than emails. In fact, the open rates are, you know, 10x that of emails. But the downside is it's, you know, emails are transactional, text messages are conversational. 
Yeah. And that was really, by the way, one of the things where we started and we learned this was we built something that allowed people to kind of blast out and do campaign management with text. Okay, that's great. But then immediately that brought in this other problem. Oh my gosh, how do I converse with 50 to 100 people at the same time? Nothing's helping me with the conversation. And that's where we said, aha, we actually were wrong. It's not just the uh, you know, campaign automation, but we actually have to build now all these smarts to enable automation and truly augmentation within the conversation itself to help you drive a conversation through. So that's what we've built in our audiences for these solo professionals and uh, what we call agents. Now, you can text back and forth with that number, but you still can't call that number. Is that correct? You can call the number as well. The number will forward uh, and we'll keep track of interactions okay. as calls, but we're not transcribing and, uh, you know, we're, it's not richly recording in the same way that text is, though we want to do that in the future. When do you think my cell phone's going to have like three numbers on it? So instead of having like three separate phones, I could have like one phone, my personal, my, you know, my work and, you know, the, the, the bat phone. Yeah, it, I think that that's, it's coming, right? Other countries, folks will have two SIM cards. They generally do it to, you know, route their calls uh, through the cheaper carriers. But I do think that there's this concept um, just like we've done with email, where you split your work email and you split your personal email, you know, messaging is becoming the center of commerce. And I think it's just a matter of time before it's a no brainer where people will go, wait a minute, you're not splitting your phone number? Like that's, that's weird. Yeah, no question. And especially with the younger generation coming up, you know, if I want to get my kids, even if I'm at dinner with them, I got to text them. Oh yeah, it's, it's unbelievable. Uh, when we look at, the stats out there in the market, depending upon you know who's generating the statistic, uh, is between seventy to ninety percent of clients prefer to text with their uh, you know kind of service provider professionals on the other end, and, and that's a shockingly huge number. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I like it for a conversation, but if a client's sending me something, please don't text it to me because figuring out where I'm going to store it. If you send me an email, it gets stored right. It gets mm -hmm. in the folders, and it's real easy. Uh, it's very difficult, but more and more people want to text and yeah. go away. That's the problem we solve. Interesting. Un unbelievable. So you've had a company uh, before. You sold that company. Then you traveled around the world. Everyone's jealous at this point. Uh, <laughs> tell us some of the lessons that you've le you learned. So you, you started a company. Did you start that company? I did. I was the founder, uh, CEO, and did it actually right, right before the Great Recession. So that was... That was quite nice, fun. Good timing. Oh, perfect timing, right? And then, and then, so you got your money, and then you went on vacation. Uh, I, well, I got the um, the funding we got right at 2008, just as the market collapsed. Oh. Uh, so that was uh, I actually remember getting a calls from New York Times, Wall Street Journal, um, you know, going, "Hey, we want to talk about your financing." And I was thinking, man, we were just doing a small Series A. You know, why are you guys even talking to me? And they're like, no, 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 you don't get it, man. Like Lehman Brothers just died. <laughs> Nobody's getting funded right now, right? This window is closed. There must be something special about you guys. Uh, but yeah, learned, learned a lot through that process. Uh, sold it in 2012 uh, to EMC. Stayed on um, with the Golden Handcuffs and as uh, an exec there for a few years. And then, um, you know, this comes, kind of comes back to personal growth, right? I realized, man, uh, what's next? Well, I have not taken a holiday in forever. I truly, the things I think that uh, it's easy to think of work as being, you know, the place where you grow, but it, it truly, it does, but only along certain dimensions. And I said, man, you know what I haven't done? I haven't gone and like backpacked through India and, you know, done these things, which just um, give me more time to reflect. So that's basically what I did for a year and figured uh, I'd go and stay at uh, hostels and, you know, sleep on rooftops, um, fording rivers and things for a little while. And well, what part of a trip would you do all over again? Oh, man. Uh, so much of it. I, I would actually do the trip um, again, but with different countries. But I'd say one of the most wonderful experiences is uh, because it's meeting the locals, right? When you're not traveling on a timeline and I'm not trying to go and hit up all the tourist spots, it actually goes back to what I think makes entrepreneurship like just so so awesome is having a little bit of freedom to say you know what 
I don't know exactly what's going to happen tomorrow. Directionally, I do, but I don't know exactly. And I'm going to leave myself open to it. And suddenly that opens up a whole different world of experiences that if I did the trip again, the exact same trip itinerary, I bet you I'd meet different people and I'd have fundamentally different conversations and I'd have different experiences and I'd grow in different ways. Yeah. I was having a conversation with someone earlier about this and, you know, so often in today's society is we're, we're going so wide, but we're going so thin and, and very shallow. Mm -hmm. the true meat, I think, in, in life is when you're going deep, you know, yeah. in, in relationships and in, in, in business, anything that you're doing, figure out that one lane and then go deep in it. That's, that's where the richness of life is, not doing a whole bunch of uh, random stuff and just you know, like stopping in, you know, to, to an airport, you, you've have three passports. Mm -hmm. right. Yes. Got, uh, Canada, U S and Hong Kong. It'd be like, you know, just dropping into Montreal and, and walking out of the airport and saying, Hey, here's Montreal. getting back in, going to Hong Kong, getting out of the plane, go out. Oh, I was in Hong Kong. No, it's about going deep. It's about getting involved. Oh, it's so right. And I'd say one thing that is, you know, tough and especially this mile a minute world is, uh, we suck as a human race. I don't mean even us as individually, but just as a human race, we suck at multitasking. Yeah. If you look at all the studies that show how cognitive function works, well, the moment you start to multitask, we're bad at it. Yeah. And yet that's actually what you know, folks, especially when they feel like they're under time pressure, do more and more. And I think it's actually a mistake. Yeah. You know, getting deep, being present, that's the place where you're actually going to get better. Yeah. And, and what's interesting about um, multitasking, multitasking can actually show up in our time blocks. It's not just, you know, minute by minute or second by second. You know, one of the things that I changed recently in my scheduling is that I have time blocks for certain things. And a lot of it was divided up into like hour, hour and a half. And I realized that, you know, even that hour and hour and a half, I was switching from one task to another and it took me a little while to get into it. I said, wait a second, this is not good. And I started to form four hour time blocks, three and a half hour time blocks. And when you do that, I mean, then you start to really dig in and it's amazing what you get done in three and a half versus three one hour segments. Ooh, I love, I love that idea. I love yeah. that idea. Yeah, it's tough. I mean, you've got you've to work your schedule uh, around it, but once you're able to do it, your productivity is going to go way up. Um, it, it's made a big difference. Yeah, I've got to try that. I'm going yeah, to see. Absolutely. I'll see if I can swing it. Well, you know, it, it's funny because I, I took it from a, a friend of mine that uh, does a lot of um, uh, productivity uh, work. And what he does is he actually schedules days. I'm like, I'm, wow. not, I'm not there yet. Yeah. I mean, he, scheduled, he schedules prospecting days. He prospects on Mondays. Tuesdays is content day. Wednesday is delivery day. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not there. I've, three and a half, four hour chunks of the best I, I can do for you. I, I love it. You know, the thing that's kind of just, um, that, that's bouncing around my head is maybe, you know, my personal trainer has been right the whole time. And it's the, you know, they always say you got to exercise certain muscle groups. You don't want to just do everything. You want to hit certain one hard and let it rest, yeah. let it percolate a little. Uh, I think there's something to be said for, you know, if you think of the mind as a, as a muscle, you know, we do have different muscle groups, if you will, within the mind. And uh, a lot of times, you know, you, thinking about a problem, I get stuck. It just takes a little bit of time for that thing to percolate. And maybe it's, you know, you hit it hard and you let it percolate for a bit and you exercise another part. Yeah. If you want to test this about multitasking, there's a great little example of what you can take. And take your first name, your last name, take uh, the city in which you live and then the street or street and then the city. Uh, no, no number on the, uh, the street. And what you want to do is if your first uh, name has five letters in it, you just draw five little dashes. And then underneath that, if your last name has eight letters in it, you draw eight dashes and, and so forth all the way down. So you got first name, last name, street, and then uh, city. And you set a timer on your iPhone and you, you go. And basically what you do is you fill in each of the letters um, for your name, address, uh, address, and then city. And then stop it. Then the next time when you go back, do it again. The second time, don't fill out your entire name and then go to your last name. Start with the first letter. So the first letter of your first name, first letter of your last name, first letter of the street, first letter of the city. And then you go down and keep doing that until it's done. You're going to spend approximately anywhere from 28 to 42% longer doing it that way because your brain has to switch to a different word and think what's the next letter. Yeah, I, I bet you. I, I was thinking off the top of my head. I was like, I think I'm going to be even slower than that. 
<laughs> what, what, how do you spell this? <laughs> yeah, our brains are not very. And matter of fact, bad news, guys. Men are worse at what's really not uh, multitasking. It's called switch tasking. Uh, we're worse at it than women. Uh, women do a little bit better job. Uh, than my, my girlfriend, uh, or I get my fiance now, reminds me of this all the time. <laughs> Well, that, that's what's going to happen from now on. You know? <laughs> she's going to remind you. You're going to forget about things years from now. And she's going to say, Leonard, do you remember when? And then you just have to shake your head. Yes, honey. I, or maybe I don't, but thank you for reminding me. There's a whole lot of rules coming up for you, man. I, I, I know. I'm, I'm, you know what? I, I love it. <laughs> Wait for the next phase. <laughs> that's awesome. So tell us some of the, you know, what are some of the things that, or, or a thing that you thought it was a great idea at the time. You're like, you know what? This is brilliant. I came up with this or somebody told me about this. We're going to implement this. You implemented it only to find out, man, that was a really bad decision. Oh, man. I'll, uh, uh, I think I already told a little bit about Hello Travel. We said, hey, it's campaign automation. And then all of a sudden it was like, actually, you need the conversational uh, augmentation on the other end. Um, I had that same thing happen with my, uh, my last startup, Simplicity which was, uh, I thought it was a freaking brilliant idea. Hey, bandwidth and storage getting really cheap. Uh, this thing, we didn't know what the name of it was at the time, but you know, now what we call the cloud, said, hey, uh, why don't I build a, uh, a, a backup technology that instead of trying to charge people up front because you know, heaven knows people don't pay for insurance, let's just have this thing which is free to install it's going to use some smarts to figure out what files are valuable on your machine and opportunistically back that up into our system, right? So you don't need to have a drive. You, don't, you literally just install an app and it just sits there in the background doing stuff. But then when you lose your data for whatever reason, uh, you overwrote the file, you deleted the file, your computer crashed, uh, we would be this last resort thing that could say, hey, uh, actually you can restore your files and we'll have an extra copy for you uh, and would just charge you at that point, right? And great, you know, the business mind in me was like, man, we're really aligning now customer value to the time that, you know, we're actually asking for money. Uh, I talked to a whole bunch of people that, oh, okay, this is a really good idea. You know, now the storage is getting cheap and et cetera, et cetera, right? Fantastic. So um, I, uh, I started doing this and <laughs> of course the, the real, um, I think the real telling thing is when, you've quit your job and you're starting to do it. And then I started serving customers, right? Pr prospective customers before I built it. And I'm starting to show them little mock-ups and stuff. And they're, I'm like, you know, hey, give me like the, the three words that come to mind after I've walked you through this experience. And they are like, there's really one that just popped out to me and I knew I was in a ton of trouble, which was they're like, feels like extortion. <laughs> and I was like, wait, 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 this is in the good case where I've got your file, right? And they're like, yeah. And I, I, I knew right then, I was like, oh my God, this is not going to work. That's great. You, you were the original ransomware. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> you know, unintentionally, right? And, and I think there's something there about just going, you know what? So that was sobering, right? Because I'm like, oh man, I just got in this, I quit my cushy job again got in this canoe, I'm paddling along, and then all of a sudden I realize I am like going up the wrong creek. This is bad. Uh, and, you know, I, I think one of those parts about being an entrepreneur is though, being able to step back and going, okay, the first response typically is, you know, maybe there's some denial. Is this really true? <laughs> right? Maybe there's even some anger. There's like the, you know, the seven phases, right? Yeah, of something happened in their childhood, you know. They're that's that's right. That's right. right. <laughs> maybe these guys are idiots. I don't know. Uh, but, when you start to hear uh, a lot of feedback, you know, one of the things is, okay, if everybody's telling me the same thing, then clearly I'm wrong. But I think the challenge then is, uh, and what makes people, you know, good entrepreneurs and the quality they have is also resilience. So what came out of that? I could have packed my bags and got home and be like, oh shit, I, I screwed the pooch on this, this is terrible. But instead it was, whew, that's hard. That's rough, right? That's something here clearly isn't working. But I'm not dumb, right? I think the, the broader trends here of bandwidth and storage getting cheaper are real. I think mobile is a real thing. Uh, what, what is this exactly? And that actually folded into what became Simplicity, which was, 
hey, wait a second, you know what they're, the, maybe the pricing model, yeah, that's probably broken, right? But the concept of people having unavailability as a problem that they have with their data is a real problem. And if I take a step back and think about what the technology is enabling and what I'm kind of seeing as trends, uh, it actually isn't about backup. What really is enabled when you have this cloud and when storage and uh, bandwidth are, are cheap is that you can actually now make sure people don't have unavailability ever. And that's where synchronization comes in. You're on another device, maybe you haven't accidentally deleted the file, but you still don't have access. You know what? I can solve now. It's not, it wasn't just backup. It was backup and yeah. you know, not, not losing access to your data. And by the way now, that means I can charge you for it and its value up front without ex you know, being like an extortionist, right? And, and I think that that's one of the key things is uh, you, on one hand, you can't fall in love with anything, an idea too much because heaven knows this is going to evolve. And, and you know, I, I'm so often wrong and, you know, many people are often wrong. But at the same time, you can't go to the other end, which is the, the challenge I think most people have becoming an entrepreneur, which is just, there are going to be a hundred out of a hundred people, 99, probably 99 and their little brother telling you you're stupid and this is a bad idea. But that's how you create great companies, yeah. right? Because it was obvious and it was easy and everybody's turning right. Uh, when you turn left, you, there wouldn't be much opportunity there, but where the opportunity lies is because, you're making a principled bet that, you know what, I think there is something here turning left, but I'm not so stupid as to become dogmatic about it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, in the beginning, you know, people, this case as a case where people looked at Uber and said, this is ridiculous. I mean, who, who, who needs this? We got taxis. You know? Yep, exactly. Yeah, exactly right. And so there's, I think, loving the spirit and the directionality of things and being open, but not getting stuck uh, on the details at times. I, I really like that because as I think back on previous uh, interviews, so often people, uh, they, they had a mindset. I think even to, to some of my clients, um, it's almost universal as I, as I think about this on, on the go here, is that they started out in one business and they ended up in a different business simply because they continued. I, I call it uh, track, measure, and adjust, TMA. Uh, they pivoted. They, they saw something and it, it, and it wasn't because it was working. Okay. It was because things started not to work and they had the foresight to say, all right, if this is no longer a great avenue, I mean, look in, you know, buggy whips, mainframes. I mean, there's all, all kinds of examples of things that we used to do. Uh, rotary phones used to sell a lot of those. We don't sell very many. And they've pivoted. And what came out of it was something that had such a bigger grander opportunity that in, in many cases, as I'm just kind of going through my files and uh, clients, they had no idea. They had no idea. It was like, it was so dark that they had no idea how they were going to get out of what, where they were and what they were being pushed into and moved into was, was something that was so much bigger than they had originally visioned with their first idea. Yeah, ab absolutely. I mean, part of it's embracing that journey. Right and going, look, uh, I might be, I might be a genius or I might be an idiot, and I'm not really sure. Where, you know, oftentimes it may be a little bit of both, right? But, uh, but it's saying, at the same time, what I, while I don't know which of the two I am right now, for example, on Hello Java, still going to play out. What I do know is how to take the next step, how to listen to feedback, how to, you know, improve. Right? That's really that's innovation is 99% perspiration and. It's not dumb perspiration. It's step-by-step -step improvement. Yeah. And one thing I, I tell people all the time is you never start over. People that have gone through, a, a, you know, creating something and it's not working, they're, oh, you know, I'm starting over. You're never starting over because you now have a myriad of information and lessons and things that you bring along with it. It, it gets so much easier. You know, doesn't it? It's like once you go through it once, it's like, oh, that's nothing. It's like, you know, the whole market crashed on me. You know, the, the technology is fine. I'll just recreate it. Not, no big deal. But the first time we go through that, it's like, what do I do? Life is over. You know, I'm, I'm going to die here. No, it, it, everything's going to be just fine.
I, uh, it reminds me, I was reading a bio on uh, George Soros uh, the other day, <laughs> light, light bedtime reading. And, uh, and basically, uh, one of his deputies, um, there was an interview with him and he was saying, you know, hey, what is the biggest thing you learned and you kind of saw with, with uh, Soros? And, you know, the, the thing that I thought was really interesting was he said, you know, Soros can take losses like nobody else that I know. Because most people, if you take a loss as a, as a trader and a fund manager, you freak out and you start to question everything that you're doing. And Soros, one of the things that saved him, you know, and made him a very good trader was uh, he could take a loss, but he would have confidence he could make it up in the next trade. And so he would focus on the next trade. And I think we see that with athletes. I think we see that with, you know, many people who have to come and do things under a crunch situation. But that's actually true for, you know, uh, people who are solo professionals, who are entrepreneurs, or just, you know, you and I working, uh, working day to day. Um, you have to understand it's always a continuum, right? We're always growing, we're always changing. And uh, it, it's good to learn from the past, but if you get uh, imprisoned by it, then it's, it's tough to grow. Now, you were one smart cookie, so I'm going to... Uh... I'm going to uh, pick your brain here. <laughs> Flattery will get you everywhere, my friend. I'm telling you, come on. You see <laughs> Berkeley, you sang at Carnegie Hall. I mean, you know, that, that's just a, a few of the things here uh, on your bio. Um, you're a smart guy. Thank you. What's, what's coming down the pike? What haven't we seen that you see it, you envision it, it coming, and it's coming soon? Yeah. I think uh, – I think AI truly is going to make a big difference in uh, the life that we, we lead. And I don't mean AI in terms of the, the sci-fi version. I, I think, you know, maybe that's going to come and there'll be like the singularity and suddenly, you know, HAL 9000 will show up. It feels unlikely. Uh, but I do think that um, we lose sight sometimes of like, what is the most common AI that's used every day that you and I use, right? Autocorrect on our phones. The Google, you know, when Google's and I type in on my, my keyboard on my, my iPhone, a almost unintelligible stream of text because there's a, a gazillion typos in there and it still knows what the heck I meant, right? And it, it does that because it's machine learned what people are actually meaning when they type in these strings and the types of mistakes that we make. Uh, that's the type of AI that actually is going to fold into our day-to-day -day lives. Um, and I think that... Uh, if you kind of think about what that is, I've, I've created a term that I'm trying to popularize. We'll, we'll see if it, it fits. All right, but, it's going out now. I, I, I call it a cognitive computing. And basically what that means is tools in the past required us to build skills and habits that adapt, we, where we adapted to the technology, right? Learn to type on your QWERTY keyboard because that's how it takes input. And we all had to learn how to touch type, right? But I think this next phase of technology is going to be more like that autocorrect. It's going to be like, okay, I think what you meant was this, right? And uh, the analogy I give in kind of uh, like our North Star here with, with Hello Chava is there are sets of habits that we kind of take for granted today. You have to learn to be productive. There are sets of habits that actually suck even after you've learned them that we just do day in, day out because we don't know of a better way. And what if you could have technology that was smart enough to kind of, you know, sit there learning about you, learning about what's going on with other people who are making similar, you know, mistakes or lack of habits. And the, the software and the technology could just come in and say, you know what, these habits, which either you do not have or you no longer wish to have, we'll just take it off your hands. It'll be like your, your phone book on your, your cell phone, right? Other than, you know, my mom and my fiance's number, I don't really remember most people's phone numbers anymore because my phone does it for me. Uh, what are parts of our lives that are literally the, you know, the, the tax that we pay every day uh, that doesn't let us be our personal best selves and doesn't really matter that we spend hours on, years of our lives doing over the course of our lifetimes? Imagine if that was all gone. And I think we can do that with technology that's coming out in the next few years. And geez, I hope that with the extra free time that we have and the ability to be more present, um, you know, it, it enables us to be just uh, better versions of ourselves. Well, technology has helped us become more present and have more time now, right? 
Yeah, that's that's right. And, and I think there, <laughs> there's there's the part of the multitasking, which is partially because, uh, you know, and I know you mean that just right. It's like, right. Uh, why am I sitting here responding to somebody? There, there's so many little things that we do because the, the technology is not meeting us halfway. It's making us carry the buckets of water over the line. Yeah. And that sucks. Uh, and so anyway, my, my dream is, and where I see this next phase is really technology doing a much better job of unburdening us, but not at a, even a global level, but down to a personal level uh, of how we work with it. Because, geez, like if it can learn to, you know, like a great ergonomic chair, just mold itself to us or, you know, a good pair of shoes, kind of take for granted, right? Imagine I sold you as a shoe salesman. I was like, hey, I got this pair of shoes for you. By the way, you're going to have to shape your foot into my shoe. Yeah. You go, what? Right? What? That makes no sense. Why would it? It should adapt to me, right? Over time. That should be like a good pair of shoes. It adapts to me. Yet, when you think about what we do as technologists, I'm effectively selling you a shoe that will never adapt to you. You are adapting your foot to my shoe. And I think that's backwards. I think the, you know, we've learned over time, actually, products really should adapt to the individual. And for the first time, we've got the, the computing power, the, the data, the analytics, and importantly, now the algorithms to be able to do that. All right. Any example that you think will uh, show up? Uh, I, I'm hoping to help lead the charge with Hello Chava, right? It's, all right. That's, that's the purpose is, uh, you know, man, think about all the manual stuff you do with texting, all the manual stuff we're keeping in our heads, right? He heaven knows if I'm not even remembering the phone number to the people I'm communicating with, am I really remembering when communicating with 100 people at the same time what my last message to someone is? Yeah. Or who are the five people who, who uh, have not been responding as frequently to me and I might be now at risk of having a dead conversation with. And so, you know, I should probably shoot them a note to just check in on them. These types of things, there's nothing that automates that. And yet you can imagine, hey, if you had a technology that was keeping track of all these convos, it could say, hey, wait a minute, you're starting to have a trail off here, right? Or the last contact time was this. We should, would you like to just text all those folks? And I'll auto build the cohort of people that this message can go out to. Uh, but, you know, it's keeping track of it for you. Nice. I, I love it. Well, tell the audience how they can get in touch with you. And you have a special offer for them as well. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I'll start with the special offer first. That's um, for any folks who are interested in using and trying Hello Chava, uh, you can get a six-month free trial if you just, as the promo code on signing up, enter in uh, Leo. That's the first three letters of my first name. So L-E-O. And then uh, 416 uh, as the numbers. Um, and that's Hello Chava. So H E L L O C H A V A dot com. Uh, and for any folks who wish to get in touch with me, you know, I got to use the same thing, of course, that uh, it's all, all messaging in the future now. Uh, so feel free to message me on my Hello Chava number, which is 815 662 42. Eight two or uh, it's eight one five six six Chava uh, on your phone. It's easier to remember. And um, I loved actually what you did at the beginning, Thor, which was uh, you know if there are any folks who just want to send me your your questions, ideas, something that you just like to get a little feedback uh, from an experienced entrepreneur, uh, shoot me a short note, and I'd be happy to respond and you know kind of pay it forward. Oh man, that that that's awesome! If can I get uh, one uh, eight eight one six get Thor? Can I? Get you know that? what? Let's let's chat after. <laughs> happy to happy to see how you hook you up. <laughs> I love it, man! Thanks for coming on. Great, great job, and I can't wait to see where this company goes. Thor, really appreciate it, and thanks for having me on your show. Thank you.